The third man there was Frank Vanderlip, president of the National City Bank of New York, the largest and most powerful of all the banks in America. Representing the financial interests of William Rockefeller and the international investment firm of Kuhn, Loeb and Company. Henry Davison was there. He was the senior partner of the J.P. Morgan Company. Charles Norton was there, president of the First National Bank of New York, another one of the giants. Also, there was Benjamin Strong, head of J.P. Morgan's Bankers Trust Company. And incidentally, Benjamin Strong, three years later, when the Federal Reserve Act was finally passed, he became the first head of the Federal Reserve System. And finally, last but certainly not least, Paul Warburg was there, probably the most important man because of his knowledge of banking in Europe. Warburg was born in Germany, eventually became a naturalized American citizen. He was a partner in Kuhn Loeb and Company. But he was also a representative of the Rothschild banking dynasty in England and France, and throughout his whole banking career, he maintained close business liaison with his brother, Max Warburg, who was head of the Warburg Banking Consortium in Germany and the Netherlands. Paul Warburg was one of the wealthiest men in the world. But those are the seven men on Jekyll Island. And as incredible as it may seem, these men represented directly and indirectly approximately one-fourth of the wealth of the entire world in those days. And these are the men who sat around a table on Jekyll Island and created the Federal Reserve System. Does it arouse your curiosity? What's going on here? Now, for the skeptics who are here tonight, and I hope there are plenty, because if there aren't, I feel like the minister talking to the choir. I know there are always plenty of skeptics in my audiences, and that makes me feel very good. For the skeptics, you're probably wondering, did it really happen that way? Surely Griffin is exaggerating to make a point. Well, yes, it really happened that way, and I'd like to illustrate that by quoting for you just one piece of evidence here. This was taken from an article that was written by Frank Vanderlip himself that appeared in the Saturday Evening Post on February 9, 1935. Remember, Vanderlip was one of those at the meeting. And this is what he said. I do not feel it is any exaggeration to speak of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. We were told to leave our last names behind us. We were told further that we should avoid dining together on the night of our departure. We were instructed to come one at a time and as unobtrusively as possible to the railroad terminal on the New Jersey littoral of the Hudson where Senator Aldridge's private car would be in readiness attached to the rear end of a train to the south. Once aboard the private car, we began to observe the taboo that had been fixed on last names. We addressed one another as Ben, Paul, Nelson, and Abe. Davison and I adopted even deeper disguises, abandoning our first names. On the theory that we were always right, he became Wilbur and I became Orville after those two aviation pioneers, the Wright brothers. The servants and train crew may have known the identities of one or two of us, but they did not know all. And it was the names of all printed together that would have made our mysterious journey significant in Washington, in Wall Street, even in London. Discovery we knew simply must not happen. Well, why? Why the secrecy? What's the big deal here? What's wrong with a group of bankers going to a private location and discussing banking or banking legislation? And the answer to that is provided by Vanderlip himself in the same article. He said, if it were to be exposed publicly that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress. 
Why not? Because the purpose of the bill was to break the grip of the money trust. And ladies and gentlemen, it was written by the money trust. It's as simple as that. Had the public been aware of that fact, at the beginning we would never have had a Federal Reserve System. That was like asking the fox to build the hen house and install the security system. Absolute secrecy was essential for that reason. Congress would never have gone for it. The public would never have gone for it. So there we're face to face with a very important fact about the Federal Reserve System that is not generally known today. It certainly wasn't known then. And that it was formed in secrecy because there was deception at work here. But there's more to it than that, much, much more. Analyze for a moment the composition of that group. Doesn't it seem strange to you that these men were all together? Here we had the Morgans, the Rockefellers, Kuhn Loeb and Company, the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, all sitting around a table here coming to an agreement. Anything strange about that mixture? Well, ladies and gentlemen, these were competitors. What's going on here? Competitors sitting around, coming to an agreement. These were the giants in the investment field, which prior to this period were beating their heads against each other, blood all over the battlefields, fighting for dominance in the financial markets of the world, not only in New York, but Paris and London, everywhere. And they're coming to an agreement of some kind. This is an extremely important fact that is generally overlooked because it happened precisely at that point in American history, which is sometimes described in our history books as the period of the dawning of the cartel. This was that point in American history when a major ideological transition was taking place in business. Big businesses which had grown to great power and size and prosperity through the process of free enterprise competition, which is what made this nation great and allowed us to surpass the old world, now were in the throes of converting their ideology to that of monopoly, the avoidance of competition. It was John D. Rockefeller I who said it. He said, competition is a sin. And it became the destiny of these people to avoid competition now at all costs. Their life effort was to eliminate their competition if they could. If that was impossible, then to buy them out. If that was impossible, then to join with them in a shared monopoly, which is called a cartel. And this was the period of history when that transition was taking place very rapidly in all industries. For the 15-year period prior to the meeting on Jekyll Island, these financial groups of which we are speaking had increasingly come together in joint ventures rather than compete with each other. They found that it worked. They liked it. And the meeting on Jekyll Island was the culmination of that process. And now we come to the second astounding realization about the Federal Reserve System is that it is not a government operation at all. It is, in fact, a cartel. They created a banking cartel and legalized it by law, passed a law to make it legal and to enforce it. That is an amazing understanding of the Federal Reserve that you're not going to find taught in your textbooks. It is a cartel. But there is a third element that is even more important than those two for an understanding of what it's doing to us. And the third element that we must understand is that this cartel went into partnership with the government. Cartels often do that to enforce their cartel agreements, but in this case they did it in spades. Now, when a partnership is formed, there has to be a reason, there has to be a benefit for the partners, or they're not going to do it. So it's a legitimate area of inquiry for us to know and to ask, what's the payoff to these partners? Why did they do that? Why is the government in it? What does it get out of it? And then we'll ask and find out why the 